I'm very familiar with lithium ion uh, data centers. I uh, probably most of them have lithium ion in them. But as I, as I was doing this research and, and I'm not a scientist or academic, my, my audience is saying, Oh no, really? You know, shocker there. But in all seriousness, um, so I just read and listen. And so you've got, you know, I've got to sort through, right. um, you know, truth sources, right? We should probably all just in our country today, sort through truth sources. A claim does not necessarily make it true. Nope. Conversation for another day. But as I listen, I try to listen to um, those that are defending a, an idea and those that are, that are detracting from an idea. What are their credentials? Are they thoughtful? If they're really noisy and attacking the people instead of the idea, I generally dismiss them. I'm more interested, you know, let's treat people as equals. Ideas are fair game for, um, you know, is it, how legitimate is it? And oh, by the way, um, one of the things that I've noticed now that I'm in my 50s, it's happened to me is, hmm, there are a lot of things that I used to hold near and dear that now that I kind of bring them back in the light of day, there are still a few of those core that I just won't change. I'm resolved on that. But a number of them, including, I'm embarrassed to say, initially renewable, not that I, it wasn't a matter of science. It was a matter of, man, that will never get it affordable. And it's, you know, it was really a casual thought. It wasn't a really thought out thought. As it's become more important for a variety of reasons, and I've come back to it really earnestly with an open mind, um, I find it a fascinating conversation. Here's a couple things in storage. One of the reasons why it's become really interesting to me is because um, our industry and even I personally really want to know more about it. If I'm going to really use renewables that I don't live on the side of the river. So I'm turning what that means is it's solar or wind or something like that. How do I make that for me personally? How do I make it for my inner, uh, my industry? And it's got to be able to ride through, right? You were talking about your adding storage, uh, for the time when there this isn't year, a sun. When I first did the solar. Yeah. L long right. time later. That's right. And, and so, the, so that's one. But also personally, you know, we're in, a, in an era of the COVID conversation and probably not the last time this is kind of a, this is a conversation that's going to happen. And I notice a lot of people around me are having a conversation about how can they get more independence, unlikely bedfellows, I might add, that would never either have this conversation um, that might be, if, if you looked at the... Um, you know, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not a pedigree, not a resume, but sort of their, their background. You would not find yourselves in a lot of common magazine subscriptions, right? Different, different magazine subscriptions That's and right. interests. However, you frame and solar, those are not always the same. Uh, I'm just saying, right? These are different, but they, what you do have in common, maybe for different reasons, but in common is I want more independence from my grid. I want more independence, um, just because I want more independence or whatever, or I want to control costs or d just a variety of reasons. And so a lot of people in my personal circle are having a conversation about that. But here's where it got really interesting to me. I discovered there's a lot more than one, not only more than one technology that's getting a lot of attention now, but the solutions have to be different because something that's happening that might be a good energy solution in Santa Clara or in San Jose or in near Berkeley or, you know, that other school, we won't mention Stanford or whatever's going on over there in Menlo Park, or whatever. That solution may be a lot different than what's happening in Bakersfield. I just right. learned that there are still people living in Bakersfield, which shocks me, but they're out there in the high desert or the high prairie yeah. and they have different options and different things at work. So if you could kind of talk about what are some of the things that are on the horizon that are allowing us to you know, to, beyond lithium ion, which is still valid. People are, were you, you were Absolutely. using it everywhere. But the other thing I learned is there's a lot of complexity. If you try to really gr ramp it up to megawatts or gigameg worth of power, that's a lot of complexity and cost in lithium ion. So I'm going to turn the mic over to you and just listen okay. to you pontificate. So, I mean, there's so many great things you brought up there. And so I have to do one little bit of the science. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Just Go for practice. it. Um, and that is, we're used to thinking about energy in terms of kilowatts or yeah. watts. How much energy does my microwave draw? How much does my TV draw? And those numbers are the peak draw. If you turn everything on your home, how right. much power do you need to run your home? Or how much power do you need to run your car? 
Right. As an interesting comparison, for most of us that you know drive a regular car, an SUV, or a pickup truck, if you floor your car and you floor your home, by flooring your home, you go turn everything on, right. your car draws around three times as much energy as your house. Oh, wow. Standard family of four. Right. And that's because that's what it takes. That's the peak energy to accelerate your car or to accelerate your home to get everything running at once, right? The mm-hmm. thing that, you know, you get yelled at by your dad when you turn everything on and leave right. it on. I yell at my daughters for turning everything on. Right. Like, but that already shows you something about the peak power you need. Okay. But the other number is how much energy do you need to run things steady state? Mm-hmm. What your phone has both of those modes. There's both the power to turn it on. That's the peak energy when it ramps up. Mm-hmm. And then there's the steady state. And for the steady state, you need to draw energy out of storage. So that's not kilowatts. That's kilowatt hours. How many hours of storage do I have in my phone? Well, my, right. my phone right now is pretty new. It lasts me about a day. When my old phone, it lasts me about four hours. Mm-hmm. Um, so the battery headroom, the space had dropped. And so as renewables have ramped up, and as you said, sun's not always on. We have this thing called nighttime. Right. Where I'm from in upstate New York, we have this thing called it's cloudy every day. Right. Um, and so even if I have wonderful solar panels, I need to balance that out with enough storage so I can charge up the storage and draw from that. Right. Well, lithium ion batteries are quite good at being cycled. They give you a reasonable amount of power pretty quickly, but if you don't use your phone for a few days and it was charged up, it will be discharged even if you're not using it. Mm. And that's, that's something that's based in the physics, the chemistry really of how lithium ion works. Okay. Other storage technologies give you these different options. And so if I'm living here in Oakland, California, I've got quite good sunshine outside. I don't need that much uh, storage capacity because it's pretty likely that tomorrow or the next day, the sun will be out and I'll recharge. Right. I'm in Seattle, Washington, or again, where I'm from, Ithaca, New York. Um, I'm going to need more power generation to bring up that storage and then to have storage that can last longer. Mm. So lithium ion is the classic battery um, option. The flow battery I mentioned before is one that stores much longer, but it's a liquid battery and it's a sulfuric acid. Most of us don't want little vats of sulfuric acid inside our cell phone when we break it. Yep. And so that one is good for industrial applications, but it's not for other applications. But there's lots of ways to store energy, and that's really the beauty. So there's a company that comes out of uh, Berkeley, also a company that comes out of, of a company in Switzerland, and they're storing energy in a flywheel. Mm. So what they do is they take a disk, it's about three feet across, and they put that spinning disc, it looks like a bicycle tire, but those ones you see in those Olympic races when it's a solid wheel, right. they spin that tire in a little vacuum and they levitate it with magnets. And that thing can just spin and spin and spin and barely degrades at all. Mm-hmm. So that's the world of flywheels. And we've already got some of those being installed by utilities. Right. And then maybe my favorite one is that I'm in California and we have something called pumped hydro. And so we've got mountains. When we, when we have power that is in excess to demand, we pump water uphill. Mm. And we do that in the Sierras. We do that in the so-called the grapevine that goes into Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. We move water to the top and then bring it back down when we need it. And that makes a lot of sense in terms of using something to move uphill. But remember, California is supposed to be a desert. Right. Water is supposed to be scarce here. Right. So why the bleep are we pumping water uphill? Using energy to pump it or right. whatever. Right. But energy, so that's right. So what you're using to pump it up is energy. But why are we pumping water? So there are new companies that have just formed. They're pumping rock uphill. They literally just use um, railroad lines. And when there's excess power in the grid, they move rock uphill because we have no shortage of rock. And when you need that power, you bring it back down. So there's a new company. It comes out of Los Angeles called Energy Vault. Okay. They have one of those big erector cranes. Yeah, yeah. And they move concrete blocks up when there's excess power. Yeah. 
and they bring them back down when you need it. And of course, those blocks, once it's up there, it can stay forever. Right. Now, that gets to your really interesting second question. You have to use energy to move it up, up, the, up move the water or the rock uphill or to charge up your battery. But as we've shifted more and more to renewables, the world of power generation has changed. Hmm. So in the old days, all power engineers, all utility executives who are older than about our age, say mm -hmm. uh, mid fifties, mm -hmm. they're used to a world where the demand for energy is low at night because most of us are asleep except for college students. I don't want to know what they're doing at night. <laughs> That's but, probably okay? good, yeah. Um, and then the, the demand for power ramps up in the morning and it peaks late in the day. And why it peaks late in the day is because at say four, five, six o'clock, businesses are still on, people are still at factory shifts, but also we're turning on our homes. Right. So you get a peak demand right when the sun's going down. And utility planners have put decades of work and billions of dollars into dealing with that peak. How do we smooth it out? Can we give certain companies incentives to ramp down? Should they do some storage at their facility? All of that goes to dealing with that late afternoon, early evening peak. Well, now the world has changed. In California, we have a million solar rooftops. Mm. And that was one of the state mandates. We hit that mandate. And so what it means today is that the more solar that goes on the grid, Instead of having a deficit of energy late in the day, we now actually can get an excess because more and more of us install solar, companies and individuals, and the solar peaks in the early afternoon, and it's still quite good till later in the afternoon, and then the sun starts to go down. Mm. So all of that solar whose market value decreases because we've got a lot of supply in the afternoon, mm -hmm. they can now send that off into storage, into that pumped hydro or that pumped rock or charging up with ion batteries or charging up flow batteries. And so now there's a new opportunity. There's a new demand for that energy. And we can then use it in the early evening when the sun is down and when we're still running lots of appliances. Mm -hmm. And that varies where you are. California turns out to have a very poor wind resource. Our wind is good early morning, late evening. That's when you get the onshore and offshore rushing flows from the mountains. Mm -hmm. But in the Midwest, the wind is ideal to meet the regular demand because in the Midwest, the wind is best during the day and it fades out in the evening. Mm. So we need in California more of this kind of storage to deal with that peak in the evening, whereas in the Midwest, they need more long-term storage because they have more seasonal patterns. During the winter, there's less sun, the wind regime shifts. And so this innovation on the science and innovation in the markets to get more and more of these different kinds of storage technologies ramped up is key. So in your business, um, in um, in data centers, and you guys have facilities all around the country, but you know, quite a few of them in California, Good Sun, Arizona, Good Sun, Florida, Good Sun, but you've also got other places I looked on the list. Mm -hmm. And you will need technologies that can store power, not just for an hour or two, but for a longer period of time. Right. And, you and know, part all of, of those different opportunities are really places where innovators in storage can see wonderful market opportunities as long as more and more states and hopefully the country overall shifts to a greener mix. So it's that it's that interesting balance between what can we do on the science of and the material science of storage and what can we do on the market to drive demand. All of that goes into you know, making our storage options diverse across the country. Hey, this is David McCall with QTS Experience. If you enjoy this conversation, please like, share, subscribe, and comment. See you next time.